Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSEC, working for communities across New York State. Hey, now let's take a moment so we all can figure it out what it's all about. It's the Homework Hotline, the Homework Hotline, the Homework Hotline, the Homework Hotline. Welcome to Homework Hotline, I'm Craig Zaramba. And I'm Sam Simpson. Homework Hotline is the place where you get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. For more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games, other online resources, and the latest episode of our show. Before we get to our brain teaser, we would like to remind our viewers that a little later in the show, history teacher Howard Krug will be here with a lesson on Rosie the Riveter. Yeah. All right. But it's Wednesday, and that means it's time for our brain Thanks. teaser. This person was born in Ripon, Wisconsin in 1859. She grew up in Iowa and graduated from Iowa State Agricultural College, where she was the only woman in her class. As a teenager, she questioned why her mother did not have the same political rights as her father. In her 20s, she became involved with the local women's suffrage movement, fighting for women's right to vote. This person joined the National American Women's Suffrage Association and traveled the country giving speeches. When the president of the association's famous women's right leader, Sue the Me Anthony, retired, Anthony appointed this person as the new president. This person led the charge to win women the right to vote. She encouraged New York State suffrage groups to work together, winning women's right to vote in New York in eight. 1917. She then continued to focus on change at the state and federal level. She developed a winning plan which fought for women's rights to vote in individual states while also focusing on the amendment to the Constitution which would give women the right to vote in the entire country. Her plan paid off and in 1920 the 19th Amendment was passed. This amendment gave the women in all 50 states the right to vote, concluding a 72-year fight for women's suffrage. For the rest of this person's life, she continued to fight for women's political freedom. She founded the League of Women Voters, an organization dedicated to providing citizens with the information they need to make informed voting choices, an organization that still exists today. If you think you can solve the brain teaser, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or just answer on our website, homeworkhotline.org answer correctly and you can have a chance to share that answer at the end of the show. Every correct response will be added to our Hotline Hall of Fame. Earn enough points and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. Today on Homework Hotline we will continue our celebration of Women's History Month and March Madness by taking a, a look at the University of Connecticut's women's basketball team. All right so I got to go over and make a correction from a problem I started yesterday so come on along okay. and then I'll start mine. All right, so yesterday I was talking about uh, Marquette and uh, Dayton, and I did a fraction analysis on how you can do uh, percentage or percentages. So when you take a percent, 31.9, and I know this is over 100 because percents are over 100, when you divide by 100, I'm moving my decimal two places to the left. So this becomes 0.319. And what I was saying was you, if you take 27, 28, and multiply it by 0.319, and I was getting this number, we'll do this right now, I go 0 .0, 0.319 times 2728 equals, I was getting 88,000, 8, it was wrong, and it made me, I was having like a brain craziness here on TV. So, um, what I was doing, I wasn't dividing by, or uh, moving my decimal three places. So, but I know now 31.9% of 2,728 is 870 shots were made for, as three pointers. So now, <clears throat> let's move along into today. And I don't want to save those changes. So, today we're starting with the March Madness, and we're going to concentrate and focus on UConn, which is a a powerhouse of a team right now, all right? And what I found out was the, the NCAA Tournament for Women's was founded in 1982. <clears throat> That's gonna come in a little important later on. 
All right, so here's UConn. They played uh, St. Francis, they played uh, Quinnipiac, and then they played Duke, and they're advancing right along here and just crushing teams, all right? Uh, they are a member of the uh, American Athletic Conference, all right? And here's some really, really uh, amazing stats about UConn, all right? They have made the Final Four 18 times and have made the Final Four 10 times in a row. They have won six of the past eight NCAA, NCAA titles. They are the number one seeded team, seeking their fifth consecutive championship. UConn has a game or has came into the tournament with a 111 game winning streak. That is just the, the, the winningest team, I think, in, in history of women's basketball, maybe even basketball in general. All right. Um, Coach uh, Gino Ariamena uh, got. Ariyama, Ariyama got his 113th victory in the NCAA tournament playing game, and uh, which gives him the most wins ever as a coach. So, when we look at UConn, they're a member of the American Conference as of 2013. And what I found out is um, they used to be part of the Big East. So there was like a, a reshuffling of the, the teams back in like 2012 to 2014, and uh, UConn decided to go with. Uh, um, the American Conference instead of staying with the Big East, um, which was founded way back in 1979. Um, UConn has a long rivalry with the University of Tennessee, and they're facing each other seven times, all right, in the uh, NCAA tournament, and UConn right now leads five to seven. So we're going to do a little math and take a look at these numbers, all right? So if we look at six out of eight NCAA titles, now, there's a couple ways we can do this, all right? One way that I'm gonna show you is if I like to work with fractions, so I got them as fractions. Whenever you come across a fraction, the, the first thing you wanna do is, if you can, reduce that fraction. So I know both of these are even, so right away I can divide both of those numbers by two. So if I divide the numerator by two, that means I also have to divide my denominator by two. Six divided by two gives me three. Eight divided by two gives me four. And now, when you're working with fractions, if you can apply your knowledge of money to this, it makes a really, really uh, big difference and helps you understand a little bit better. Because I know three quarters is equal to 75, 0.75, all right? And that's gonna give me a percent, 75% of the time. Now that's a decimal, so I would multiply that by 100. Uh, 100, which would give me 75%. So they're winning 75% um, of the last eight NCAA titles, all right? Um, now, if we look at their rivalry, UConn, they played seven games. So UConn has won five of those seven. So I have to do a fraction five out of seven. So again, we're gonna do a percentage. Now, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna put your five on the inside and we're gonna divide by seven. All right, so now when I see this, I know that uh, seven goes into, it doesn't go into five at all. So what I have to do is I'm gonna add a decimal and put a couple zeros out here. And now I know that seven goes into 50, carry my decimal up there, it goes in four times, or uh, excuse me, I'm thinking of the answer here. It goes in seven times. Seven times seven gives me 49. I subtract and I get a one. Subtract gives me, bring down my zero. Uh, seven goes into 10 one time. Uh, I subtract, minus seven gives me a three. I bring another zero down. We're gonna go one more place. Seven goes into uh, t uh, uh, 30 uh, four times. So if I rounded this, which we will, we'll round to two places, it would be seven, one, four, and the four would make the, the one stay, so it would become 71%. So with their rivalry with you, uh, with Tennessee, they got a 71% a uh, better chance of winning the next game than uh, Tennessee does. Now, um, one of the things that I also found out is the Final Four is played since 2008, or starting at the present of 2018, if we go back, founded in 1982, let's find out how many years that is, 2018, and we subtract 1982, 10 minus, uh, or I mean eight minus two, it gives me a six. I can't take eight from one, so it becomes 11. This becomes a 19. 11 take away eight gives me a three. Nine uh, take away nine is zero. So it's been in existence 36 years, all right? Now, UConn has appeared 18 times. They've played 18 times in the, in the championship. So I know if I do 18 times out of 36 years, again, both of those are even numbers. And right away, I know that 18 goes into 36 two times. So I'm gonna divide both of these by 18, all right, uh, 18 divided by 18 is gonna give me one, 
36 divided by 18 is gonna give me two. So that means 50% of the time, UConn has been in the, in the tournament, which is crazy numbers, all right? So I'm hoping that helps you guys out and understand how, how good of a team and a college that UConn has for their athletics. Thanks. A fun way to help you remember Roman numerals is the saying, I value xylophones like cows dig milk. I stands for one, V stands for five, X stands for 10, L stands for 50, C stands for 100, D stands for 500, and M stands for 1000. And now we'd like to welcome Howard Krug to the show. Hey, Howard, I'll be careful. You got a broken thumb there. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. gentlemen. Right. Thank you. Playing basketball? <laughs> no. I was riding my bike. All right. And it was kind of icy, and I slipped on the okay. ice and rolled yeah. and broke Ouch. the thumb. Sometimes that happens when you're not careful. Hey, but today we're going to talk about Rosie the River, okay? Right. Not right. about my thumb, right. although it's kind of cool, right? Okay, Rosie the River, she was a lady who, uh, you know, icon. That symbolized yeah, millions, yes. Yes. millions of women working in the shipyards, working for World War II, you know, for the munitions to help the men while they're fighting at mm -hmm. war. And she came to symbolize the saying, we can do it. And those ladies did do it. They really did. We all know World War II began. Why? We learned it. Uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor. Bombing Correct. of Pearl Harbor. Excellent. So this is the real Rosie the Riveter, Naomi Parker Fraley. She was a California waitress when she, um, later when she passed away, January 18th, 2018. Just this year, that's For wow. 70 years, wow. nobody that's really crazy. knew who Rosie the Riveter really was, wow. and that is her. Thank running you, Naomi. Cool. Yes, running the mill. So in World War II, approximately 4 million men, after the bombing, December 7th, 1941, went to work, went to war, I'm sorry, sure. in 1942. So you've got a problem. Over 12 million men would leave for the war by 1945. Wow. That's a lot. And if men, gentlemen, were working all, if in, they were the factory workers, factories sure. before the war, yep. now you've got a problem. How do you produce all the goods? What do we do to support the gentlemen to get uh, the troops, supplies, the, the planes? The How bullets, do we build the yep, ships, yep. the bullets, everything? Yeah. The car factories would change over to tanks. Fords yep. would not be built. Ford Model T would turn over to tanks. Wow. So you've got, what do you do? Well, we got a see, think, wonder. I just want to do this real quick. I'm not going to write. I'm having a little bit of trouble. All right. But we'll look at this, right? So what do you see? Give me three, four things you see. Uh, she's holding the newspaper. She's holding the paper. Okay. Yep. What is her expression? Always look at what the expression is. Mm. Kind of distant. You yeah. know, she's like out looking maybe out. She's yeah. thinking. Yeah. Thinking. She is okay. really thinking. And what can she do? And you got a flag in the background. I see a, a wedding ring. Wedding ring. Yes. Yeah. That's very important. So her husband is at war and she has to support him. So you're thinking, what exactly are you going to do to support him? Get a war job. Sure. Ah. It was the most brilliant campaign ever okay. in the history of the United States. It got a lot of women to work. In fact, um, it was one of the most successful wow. advertising campaigns Impressive. in the United yeah. States. Two million women joined the workforce in 1942 alone. Wow. wow. That's so a lot. just g this idea, get a war job. It's always there. Longing won't bring them back. You got to do something. You got to be a part of it. So women went to help their husbands, went to help their went to dads, work factories. Yeah. factories, and they worked sometimes double shifts and would come home late at night. Check the number out, gentlemen. By 1945, 19, 19 million, million. Wow. women would be working outside of the home supporting the war effort. And when you look at that and we think about that, that's a lot. Because in World War II, when they were going over and fighting in World, World War I, World War I, World War I yep. thank you, yep. World War I, there was only 2 million women who were wow. in jobs then. Wow. 19 million wow. in four Two years. Versus 19, baby. That's crazy. It's baby. amazing. Yep. It is absolutely amazing. As we look at this, this Rosie the River. They came in all shapes and sizes. She's doing slag. De-slagging. De-slagging. So weld, when you yep. do a weld on a ship, it looks like a ship. She's scraping off the weld so it's a nice clean weld yep. so the water won't come in. And here's a number that's interesting. Women working for the war effort, 35%. And of that, 
Eighteen percent of them would be African American. Yeah, almost half. Yes, yeah. they would come up from. More than the, half. They would come from the south. They yep. would leave the domestic servants, and they would come in and help out. And Glad that they did. Is really awesome. Yep. Women in the workforce today. Well, women just didn't. Stay, well, they, they didn't come yeah. and leave the workforce. They didn't. Right. They're still yet there. Yeah. That's another story. But forty-seven percent of U.S. women are workers today. Okay. I'm sorry. Women um, own close to ten. Million, million businesses, businesses. Wow. accounting for 1.3 trillion in receipts. Wow. Mothers are the sole primary earners of 40% of all households compared with children under 18 compared to 11% in 1960. Women have come a long way in the it's workforce. Well, now they? it's they're doing more. Yeah, yeah, but they're still yet not paid the same. Right. That's a whole nother story. Yes. They still yet don't make as much as men, sometimes 80 Five cents to the one dollar that a man makes. Female veterans tend to contribute uh, service in the labor force. Three out of ten of them serve in the government today. Cool. And as we look, we say thank you, Naomi, oh, there she is. Parker Fraley, and countless there other women. Cool. There she is, cool. the real Rosie the Riveter. I'm Howard Krug. This is History Hotline, and I'm out. Thank you, gentlemen. Right. We thank would you. like to thank Howard for being here. Now stay right there. We'll be back in a second. How do you know which century you live in? 21st century equals 2000s. 20th century equals 1900s. 19th century equals 1800s. 18th century equals 1700s. And 17th century equals 1600s, and so on. Last week, we asked you, what would your personal mascot or symbol be and why? Would it reflect who you are? Would you include interests, talents, or skills? Here are some of the things you had to say about this topic. Charissa says, my mascot would be a crown with an arrow through it because I love the heart arrow emoji. All right. <laughs> Uh, Himena, or Himena says, my symbol would be a star because it is my favorite shape and I see them every night. I also want to be a star because I enjoy drawing and singing. Uh, Tatiana wrote, my personal symbol would be a girl making an X with the arms, protecting a younger girl. I think this because I have a sister and I will always protect her and keep her safe. I think it would reflect who I am because it is in my heart to be caring for others. Maida says, my personal symbol would, be, would probably be a peace sign, a smile, a star, and a history textbook. The peace sign because I have a peaceful nature, the smile because I like everyone to be happy, and finally the history textbook because history is my favorite subject. Well, I'm glad. I hope she was watching huh? Howard today. Howard, yes, yeah. not math. Right. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. So, yeah, I, um, we're really appreciating you guys' responses, and you guys have some very, very good points about the, the questions we're asking. Yes, yes, they do. We're going to continue talking about the University of Connecticut, and I want to talk about why they're such a dominating team. And they are dominating. They are a dominating team. Come cool. over to the board with me. So I started this off by saying the University of Connecticut women's basketball program is the most dominant team in collegiate sports history. Is that true? Maybe. Those guys did a great job about talking a lot about math, so I'm not going to do as much math as I am going to be presenting data or statistics. Let's take a look. Um, Craig talked about March Madness. You've heard it a lot out there, do you? And you really know what it is? Well, there's a men's March Madness, but there's also a women's March Madness. It's all about the best basketball teams in the country coming together. I'm talking about the women's basketball um, March Madness. There are 335 University Division I teams. 335 teams. The top 64 will come into March Madness and play. You saw the, the um, I guess, the matching uh, layout from Craig's, and I'm going to do that a little bit more. But the top 64 teams, they play each other. The winners, the six, uh, 32 winners, they play each other. And the 16 winners become the sweet 16. Those 16 players play again, play again, play again. To win the national championship, you have to win six games in a row. So it's not easy to do. So I really wanted to put this bracket up here. And as Craig was showing you, literally what they do is they break this thing down into 
they break it down into like four conferences and they play all over the country. This one is actually played in Albany here in New York. They have another set of teams playing in Spokane, another set of teams playing in Kansas City, and another one in Lexington, Kentucky. So they're playing all over the country. All of these teams are playing. I talked about Connecticut being dominating. Their first game, 140 to 52. That's dominating. I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't, they might have some fans out there, so I'm just 140 to 52. Um, I was looking in the USA Today the other day and I saw this. Universe, uh, University of Connecticut women advance to their 25th straight sweet, sweet 16. So they got into the tournament, they won a game, and they won another game, and they've done it for 25 years in a row. You gotta go back to like 1992 when they didn't make it. Um, some of the statistics that Greg talked about, beginning in the fall of, of 2014, the Huskies went on this 111 game winning streak. It's over three seasons. This streak included two national championships, so they won this six game in a row a few times. They made history by being the first team in the NCAA Division I women's basketball to win four consecutive national championships. So what I did here is I pulled in all of their scores for all of their records. What I really want to point out to you is their winning percentages. 97%, 100%, 97%, 100%, 90%, 87%, 95%, they just win. Maybe they lose, but then they win a whole lot more. Summing all of that up, they've won 11 national championships. Their all-time record is 88% of their games. They've gone to the tournaments, they've just won. And this kind of like sums it all up. But one of the things I really want to spend a couple of minutes talking about is their coach. Some say Gino is the best coach ever, bar none. He has the statistics to prove it. Prior to him going to the University of Connecticut, they only had one winning season. Since he's been there, they've won 11 national titles. Eight, they've been to 18 Final Fours. They've had six perfect seasons without any losses, and they won 45 conference titles. A little bit more about them. 11 national championships. I just highlighted the, the ones that stuck out the most to me. 11 national championships, winning streak of, not only do they have a 111 game winning streak, they also had a 90 game winning streak. 100% to me as a teacher, the most important thing, everybody on his team graduates. They have 100% graduation rate. His 32 year average overall record stands at 991 uh, um, wins, 135 losses. That 88% is the best winning percentage in the history of the sport. What I put up here is the top um, men's and women basketball teams, their coaches and their winning percentages. These are the women teams, these are the men's teams. So these are, have all won over a thousand games. Here is their coach at uh, 1,023, but if you look at the winning percentages, he does have the highest percentage. That is impressive. So if I think he's, that's the most dominating team, I would say they are the most dominant team, the most dominated team in collegiate sports. Having trouble remembering the number of days in each month? Think of this saying: 30 days hath September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31, except February alone, which hath but 28 and fine till leap year gives it 29. All right, we have a winner in tonight's math, uh, our, not math, our brain teaser. Hi, Matthew. Hey. Matthew, who's the winner to our brain, who's the answer to our brain teaser? Carrie Chapman Cat. All right. Cool. Now, were there some clues that we gave you, or did you already know this? I had to 
I'll look it up in an encyclopedia. Whoa, cool. you still have encyclopedias? encyclopedias? I know. That's cool. Yeah. Right. <laughs> didn't, have to use, didn't actually use the internet. All right. Wow. <laughs> cool. Wow. Did you find out anything interesting about her? Hmm. Um, nothing that I can really recall on such short notice. Cool. Wow. But, I'm glad but that she's very interesting. Excellent. I'm glad that you actually had an encyclopedia. That was very, very cool. Well, I found out that she started the Women of Leading Women of the League of Women Voters. What I thought was pretty cool because they educate voters today on making smart decisions. Right, about instead of just going in and flicking a, a lever. All right. Thank you very much, Matthew. Congratulations. Okay. Don't forget, every correct response goes into our Homer Cotline Hall of Fame. Earn enough points, and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. That's all that we have time for tonight. Tomorrow, we will finish up our celebration of Women's History Month. Bye, guys. Good night. Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers, working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSET, working for communities across New York State.